Well, welcome one and all. Thanks for tuning in this morning to the Wealth Guardians radio program. This is the show before Christmas, and we've got Bryce uh, sitting here beside me, dressed up in his Santa suit. Jingle, jingle, jingle. <laughs> I didn't mean to bring my jingle bells in so that I could make that sound effect here, and I forgot them. Isn't that just uh, the way to cap off 2020? Oh, well, that's... <laughs> hey. Looking forward to 21. No kidding. It's got to be better. Yes, I don't see how it could possibly be worse, but I'm going to go ahead and knock on wood just in case anyway. <laughs> please, please, 2021, don't be like your sibling. Yeah. Well, listen, folks, uh, as we always try to do, we want to send out a uh, warm thank you to all of our uh, veterans, service members, first responders, uh, everybody out there in harm's way doing God's work for us. Thank you so much, and for your families as well. And this is the toughest time of the year to be doing that, particularly if you're overseas or not able to be with your loved ones. So thank you for your sacrifices and your commitment to making this country as uh, the beacon that uh, President Reagan wanted it to be around the world. So thank you, everybody, for your uh, your sacrifices and your efforts in keeping this country as great as possible. Doug, we've got a good show here today. We're going to talk about uh, things that in, at least in the financial world, things that nobody says. So I was taking a look at this list before uh, we sat down here this morning, and uh, these were kind of cracking me up. I like these. You found this. This is this is a good list. Yeah. So uh, there are things that people in our field, you as me as financial advisors, as fiduciaries, as retirement specialists, people who help those figure out how to be on the best uh, track for retirement. There are things that we hear people say all the time. And uh, we can almost kind of predict sometimes what somebody, how somebody's going to answer a specific question. And then there's this list here of things that you and I have never heard anybody say before. And uh, I want to go through this list. This is good, Doug. I'm glad you found this. <laughs> so the first thing that uh, you and I have never heard anybody say is, you know, Doug and Bryce, I really regret putting money in my Roth IRA every year. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> Who doesn't want a pot of tax-free money growing the, every single year? <laughs> it's the best kind of pot of money is the tax-free kind, yes. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. So, yeah, folks, uh, just in case you weren't aware, you can generally have your investment monies in three different types of pots uh, on a broad level, uh, non-qualified accounts, which is generally like your checking or your savings account or a brokerage account that you have to pay the taxes on the growth every year. There is an IRA account, which means you don't haven't paid any taxes on the monies in there, but you will have to pay taxes on the full amount based on whatever your current tax bracket is at the time that you take it out. And then there is the holy grail of uh, tax-qualified monies, Roth IRA monies, which is monies that you've already paid taxes on. You're saving them for retirement, and as long as you don't touch them before you're 59 and a half, when you do take them out, the growth is 100% tax-free. So if you put in $10,000 and it's grown to $50,000 over the course of decades, you can touch that whole $50,000 without paying another penny in taxes. That is a huge help to a retirement plan, Doug. Boy, it sure is. And I'll tell you what, we will never see anybody say that. Nope, I, don't, I doubt it. If so, we probably need to recommend they go somewhere else than to a financial advisor. Perhaps, I like the next one too, perhaps Bryce. Perhaps a doctor. Okay, let's go to the next one. You know, in retrospect, I I probably should have spent more and saved less over the years now because I don't know what I'm going to do with all this money before I pass away. <laughs> yeah, nobody's ever said that. In fact, what's interesting is when we sit down with uh, the uh, initial uh, client, uh, one of the questions we ask them is mm -hmm. uh, knowing now, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently with your money? And almost everybody says some version I wished I'd have saved more, or I wished I'd started saving sooner. Started saving yeah. earlier, yeah. yes, yes. Of course, when you look back, when you're 20 and 30, time is not a concept that you have a good idea of, and uh, taking ladies out to dinner or buying that new car or whatnot, that's a number one priority, and retirement is an abstract concept way off in the distance. And so, unfortunately, a lot of people don't start to save until – uh, much later than they should have. Well, you if, know, if you do start saving early, 
then you you do have that problem. What am I going to do with all this money uh, before I pass away? And that, folks, quite honestly, is the better of the two problems that you could have in retirement planning. And I'm sure you can find a way to spend it. Yes. So, Bryce, I'm going to give you this next one. I like this one, too. This is this is interesting. The life insurance payout I got when my husband died was a little insulting because it's like he thought, I couldn't handle the finances without some help. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, folks, when, when one of the spouses passes away, the finances change in both aspects, how much uh, life on a monthly or a yearly basis costs and the type of income that is coming in. And if you have a mortgage or the kids are still um, not um, self-sufficient and out on their own, those expenses don't cut down by a quarter like they should. And so if we're down to one paycheck and you still got 90, 95% of the expenses, that's going to be a problem. Now, another question that we ask, Doug, uh, is when we're sitting down with our clients and asking them to prioritize what topics they want to cover throughout our process, one of the ones that we ask is um, supporting your spouse after you pass. And usually the spouses are sitting together because they answer, well, a 10, yes, I, I certainly want that to be mm-hmm. a, a, a concern, and I, I want to make sure we address that. But yes, if you do are concerned or do have concerns about making sure that your spouse, in the event of your passing, is well cared for financially, then life insurance is one of those best ways to help that situation remedy itself. You know, a little funny caveat to that uh Folks, as we grade that uh, that question on a scale of one to ten, yes, you know, uh, do you care? Uh, do you want to make sure your spouse is cared for after you pass? Well, just about everybody says a ten, particularly it's, if their spouse is sitting there. Especially, <laughs> I do remember several years ago a couple was in, and the guy said, "Uh, four. right in front of her, right in front of her," <laughs> and, and I almost dropped my pen because that never happened before. And quite uh, unsurprisingly, they never showed back up again. <laughs> <laughs> they went to a different type of counselor. I think they point. did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. All right. So the next one here is, uh, and, and again, this is things that uh, a financial advisor never hears anybody say. You know, it makes me feel patriotic to pay more taxes than I have to. So I don't enjoy finding ways to pay less. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I don't think I've ever heard of that. I, I don't think that I have either. And what I tell people is, look, I don't mind paying what I'm obligated to pay because I understand that our taxes go to pay for our military and to pay for police officers and school teachers and roads and whatnot. So we we can't live in a society where taxes aren't paid and still have those niceties. But I would just assume if I've got extra money to give away, I would rather go to my charity of choice rather than Uncle Sam. He's not really a charity. I tell you, over the years I've been doing this, what I find is people will not take money out of their retirement accounts because they hate to pay the tax on it. And I encourage them to take the money out and enjoy it. They've earned it, you know. And I tell every one of them, I said, look, if you don't enjoy this money now, your kids will. Yeah. But they hate doing it. They hate paying the tax on it. They do. And, you know, that's one of the main reasons that we see people making bad financial decisions for themselves or investment decisions is because they don't want to move the investments in a non-qualified account because it's going to um, be a taxable event. And that is, folks, that is not a reason to not get yourself properly allocated in your investments is because you just don't want to pay those taxes. Always remember that in a non-qualified investment account, 100% of that money is not yours. Around 20 to 25% of that or so already belongs to Uncle Sam. So if you get in that mindset now, it's not going to be so hard for you later to make those uh, taxable event moves. That's why we're such big believers in doing Roth conversions. Absolutely. Pay the tax now while it's low. It's going to be higher in the future. Absolutely. And we help our clients figure out the, the strategies to do that. Doug, we've got one more here before we're going to uh, do the trivia question and go to a break. The last one here is that, again, things that a financial advisor never hears somebody say. I love the big market corrections. I love it. It's like a really fun roller coaster ride. 2008 was probably my favorite year. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) I never heard that. I have not either. And again, folks, um, volatility while you are saving for retirement is okay. But volatility while you are approaching retirement or in retirement is a whole different ball game. That remember, that's now when 
your investments are the source of your paycheck, not this uh, bucket of money on the side and you're still getting your paycheck from a different source. So when the market goes down 50%, like it did in 2008, that can have a serious impact on your paychecks and you want to avoid volatility like that. So don't have not heard somebody say 2008 is their favorite year when it comes to finances. And that's exactly why we have downside protection on all of our clients' portfolios. And if you want to hear more about that downside protection or you want to uh, make sure that you're not saying any of these things or you thought, hey, I said number three. Why, why shouldn't I be saying number three? Then uh, pick up the phone. Give us a call, 336-391-3409. You can also go find us on the web, www.thewealthguardians.com. Dot com. We're happy to sit down with you. Just give a Joy or Lynn a call and uh, set up a time to sit down with us and we'll help you figure out if you're already doing all the best things that you can for your retirement planning or if there is something more that we can point you in the direction of that will just make your retirement situation all the much better. So, folks, thank you for sticking around. We've got our trivia question now, and we're going to make it a little bit holiday-oriented here. So let's see who knows the answer to this. Thomas Edison's assistant... Edward Johnson is credited to being the one who came up with what holiday tradition? Hmm. Thomas Edison's assistant, Edward Johnson, is credited to being the one who came up with what holiday tradition? Folks, if you know the answer to that, stick around and see if you are right. If you don't know the answer to it, take a guess and stick around and see if you are right. We will be right back after these messages. And welcome back to the holiday episode of the Wealth Guardians radio show here in chair one is Doug Ray, and in chair two, the producer's chair, is me, Bryce Payne. Thank you, folks, for sticking around through the break. And if you're just tuning in to us, let me remind you who we are. We are financial planners, fiduciaries, retirement specialists operating on that fiduciary standard. And we help people who are around five to seven years from retirement, and they are looking to confirm that they're making the best decisions for retirement. We help them out at a no-cost, no-obligation process get a second opinion and help them make uh, the right proper decisions so they can learn how to retire the job and keep the paycheck in retirement. And all they have done and all you have to do to sit down with us is pick up the phone and give us a call at 336-391-3409. That's 336-391-3409. We would love to sit down with you and help you figure out if you're making the best decisions for your retirement planning as well. Now, before the break, we asked a holiday-oriented trivia question, and this was it. Thomas Edison's assistant, Edward Johnson, is credited to being the one who came up with what holiday tradition? Now, I know that seems very vague, but there is a clue in there. Thomas Edison's. Hmm. assistant so have something to do with a light bulb ah you're very good very close you're yeah you're very close very be a little warm. bit be a little bit more specific uh, there what about a light bulb putting lights on a christmas tree? there you go perfect folks doug ray the genius at work here uh, he didn't stump me this no time. that thomas edison's assistant edward johnson is credited for being the one who came up with the idea of not putting candles on a dried out combustible tree inside <laughs> yeah. your house, but switching those out for electric lights. Pretty ingenious idea there because uh, candles catching a tree on fire and burning the house down was kind of a common thing back before this. Have you, have you ever burned a Christmas tree? I have never burned a Christmas tree. You mean uh, like outside yeah, or inside? Yeah, outside. Yeah, I probably have. They go up like yeah. Boom. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, it's not the soundest idea to have one of those sitting in your house for sure. Hey, hey Bryce, speaking of light, did you hear about the uh, Christmas star that's supposed to happen Monday? No, I haven't. Tell me. 21st, Monday evening. It is a special alignment between Jupiter and Saturn. No kidding. It only happens every 800 to 1,000 years. Okay. It's supposed to be an extremely bright light. And a lot of scholars think this could be what happened? the star of Bethlehem. The, the, north, the northern star. Ah. Yeah. So... It's Monday evening, look up in the uh, southwestern sky, close to the setting sun, and hopefully we have clear skies yeah. so we can see this. Right. Well, it's supposed to be dry and uh, not a lot of precipitation for Because I don't think I'll so. be here in 800 years. No, well, you're, you're looking pretty good. You're looking pretty good to me. I wouldn't put it past you. You've planned for retirement well enough that you could be. <laughs> All uh, right. So and I've got another fun fact here about these. Um, North Carolina is one of the two top producing um, Christmas tree farm states. Do you know what the other one is in the U.S.? Well, I don't think it's Florida. 
It's not Florida. Um, it's not New Mexico. I'd say Virginia. No, it's on the other coast. It's on the left on coast. On the other coast. Okay. Uh, it, Oregon? It is Oregon. Okay. Yeah, Oregon and North Carolina are the two biggest Christmas tree farm locales in the United States. So I've got a couple of friends, actually, who have some out there. So, hey, Griggs. All right, folks. Uh, we're going to start talking now in the second segment about what drives your financial advisor crazy. Doug? You take over for this one. What drives us crazy? All right. The first one is hidden fees. Yes. You know, what kills me is when somebody comes in and they say, oh, gee, I'm only paying my advisor 1%. Yeah. Well, that's not true. That is not true. Uh, well, they are paying their advisor 1%, but, but that's not all they're that's paying. That's exactly right. There are <laughs> hidden fees, especially if you own a mutual fund portfolio. And most 401ks, that's what you have to invest in is, for, is, is mutual funds. Right. One of the things we do in our planning process, which occurs on meeting number two, is we uncover all those hidden fees for you. We have some special software that we lease out that it, that information would not be available to the typical investor or advisor. You have to lease out the software, but it does reveal, based on what your mutual fund portfolio is, what all those hidden fees are, and it's quite astounding. Yeah, and most people are amazed. And I'll just give you a quick hint. If you own mutual funds you are probably paying fees north of 2.5% per year. The average that we see come through here when we add up all the fees is between 3 and 4%. Yep. We've even seen some outliers as high as 6.5%. Yeah, crazy year. stuff. Yes, indeed. So hidden fees does drive us batty, but we also are able to reduce those fees in most of our portfolios down to uh, a fraction of that, uh, cutting them in half usually um, from what somebody's already experiencing. So in that sense, we can improve the situation. Yep, Absolutely. Okay, the next one, advisors who put their own goals ahead of their clients. You know, here, here is, what do you call an advisor who puts his own goals ahead of his clients? Uh, a crook. <laughs> I was going to say an advisor because they still are allowed to call themselves advisors. Well, true. But they are not a fiduciary. They're not a fiduciary. That's where that magic word comes into play. Crook's so. a little heavy-handed, I think, but still, it's, uh, you know, you, you just can't put your own goals ahead of your clients. Yeah, and oddly enough, over 50% of people out there who are advisors are not fiduciaries. They are allowed to put their own interests at the same level as their clients' interests. Now, let's hope that they don't do that. Let's hope that they do put their clients' interests ahead of theirs, but they but don't they're not to. they're not obligated they're not to. Obligated. But That's based right. on your certificates, my licenses, my certificates, we are obligated to act on the fiduciary level, which means we have to make recommendations that are in our client's best interest and not consider what is in ours. Folks, doesn't that make sense that if you're going to go to an advisor and seek advice that you would want somebody who is obligated to give you that advice based on what is in your best interest? I would think, you know, that could go back to our first segment, things that we never hear somebody say. I wish I had gone to an advisor that wasn't a fiduciary. <laughs> no, never hear that. I can I can tell you this. I've, I'm old enough and been in the business long enough that uh, – when I first got started, there was no fiduciary standard. Everybody was, uh, you know, just out there and could do anything they wanted to do. But, you know, it's something I've always tried to, to put in my practice. I'm not going to do something for me that I wouldn't do for a client. Right. You know. Right. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this quick story. Please. When I first learned, got into the brokerage business, I learned about shorting a stock. Okay. So I was never going to recommend a short sale to a client before I actually tried it myself. Well, do you remember back in the late 80s when all the banks and the SNLs were going under? Yes, I do. The Lincoln. Yep. I found the ugliest bank in California that I knew this thing was going down. Okay. So I shorted that sucker in my own account. I'll bet you dollars to donuts it was the lowest price that stock ever got when I shorted it. No kidding. Because <laughs> the moment I shorted it, it turned around and it started going up and uh. up and up. Moral of the story, folks, don't short a stock. There's other ways to play the downside. I lost probably three or $4,000 because in a short sale, to cover your short, you got to buy the stock back. So I ended up having to buy it back at a higher price than I sold it at. So fun story. Never shorted since. Fun story. Way to sell us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that's uh, that is advisors who put their own goals ahead of their clients. Yeah, that is something that bugs us. Another one that bugs us is cookie cutter or one size fits all sales pitches. Mm, yeah. And there's plenty of them out there. There are. You can't get about more cookie cutter than buy and hold. That's for sure. 
And that is one of the two types of investment strategies out there. Buy and hold means that you don't change your portfolio based on what the market's doing. You keep that same portfolio diversified, preferably, and a number of different stocks and or bonds. And you hold on to that throughout, regardless of whether the market's going up, down, sideways, or nothing. And that is about as cookie cutter as it gets. And if you call up the big firms, uh, the names that you'd recognize, that's what they're going to preach. Yeah, and you just ride the cookie cutter up and down, up and down, up and down. And, you know, right now I'm, I'm thinking of this major national firm that advertises on TV all the time mm-hmm. that says they don't have cookie cutter portfolios. Well, yes, they do. Yes, they have they do. cookie cutter portfolios that you'll ride up and down and up and down. Yep, yep. And there is nobody who ever – excelled past the market and did really, really well for themselves by being in a cookie-cutter portfolio their entire life. Yep. They might have might have kept up with the market, but they're not going to excel past it. And, Doug, go on with the next one there. we got three, three minutes left here. Big companies who push products. Oh, I remember that well. Oh, you got your start there. Mm-hmm. I got my start there. You know, when you go to work for a brokerage firm, doesn't matter which one, You can only provide to your clients what they let you provide or tell you to provide. And there's rewards for providing those things. Yeah, and and most of the time, uh, you know, I was with a major wirehouse, and they really pushed us to sell their product, Mm -hmm. you know, the name brand product. And uh, quite honestly, there was much better options for the client out there that you could sell to them. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, this uh, wire house eventually sold their uh, their line of uh, mutual funds uh, to another another company and got out of the yep. mutual fund business. Yep, a but, big bank uh, that we recognize. Yep. So anyway, um, yeah, big companies who push products. So ideally, you'd rather your you'd rather your advisor not be associated with any particular firm or insurance company or whatnot, and could offer you the best of the best out there at any time. Well, that's why I went independent in '98. You know, I wanted to be able to offer the best thing I could find at the time to my client. And you cannot do that when you're working for a big firm. Right. Absolutely. So 22 years this firm has been in business. Thanks to Doug. The next one, uh, what drives financial advisors crazy? Buzzwords and jargon that don't mean anything to the average person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I learned a long time ago that, uh, you know, when you're sitting down in front of somebody – they obviously are not in this business or they wouldn't be in front of you in the first place. And you've got to talk to them at a normal conversational level. You know, why in the world would you say phrases like standard deviation, R squared, sharp ratio, all this other stuff that you and I know because we had to, they don't have a clue. Right. They'll just look at you and eyes may roll back of their head and, and, and they won't understand a thing. So you just, you know, I like, it's a KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. That's right. Speak at the level of the client and uh, don't try to impress them with your yeah, your knowledge. Because you're your not terms. impressing them. No, no, absolutely. And the last one that we've got here, financial plans that consist of dozens of pages that no one can understand. Now, we just uh, are uh, bringing in a client that we've been working with for uh, the last couple of weeks, Alan and his wife, Kate, and... We have a a, a good uh, portfolio or a good um, binder presentation at the end of all the reports that we've done, and he understood it, but he had shown us at the beginning where he was coming from, the firm that he was coming from, had a similar type of, of packet, a little bit thicker, a little bit smaller print, and he said, I can't understand anything in this. And it looks good. You know, you, you look at it and you say, oh, these guys must really know what they're doing. But it has to mean something to the client. And we have designed ours to where it speaks on the level we think most of our clients are are at or coming from so that it's not just the Rosetta Stone there that means nothing to you. It It is something that uh, you can understand and uh, write questions off of and learn from. Yeah, and we don't put additional pages in there just to make it look thick and uh, impressive, you know. Every page has important information on it that pertains to you and your retirement. Absolutely. 
Yep. Well, uh, those are the uh, six things that what drives financial advisors crazy. Doug, what doesn't drive me crazy is finally getting to Christmas time and being able to say goodbye to 2020 here. I know you're that same way. Yep. And you've got uh, you and Sherry are going to be down in Charlotte uh, for Christmas. I'm going to be up here in Winston-Salem with my wife and maybe my daughter. I hope you have a good holiday season and uh, we'll see you when next year. Next year. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, folks. Folks, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.